My name is Sophia. This story happened to me in 2015, when I was 13 years old. At the time, I was living in Italy with my father, my sister, and my brother. Unfortunately, my mother left us when I was little, because of severe mental issues. In 2008, my family moved back to my father's home country, and the house that he grew up in, which was a three-story house surrounded by forest. We stayed on the third floor. One day, my sister and my dad left for a few days, and my brother was staying at a friend's house in a nearby town. My Aunt Rosa came and picked me up from school that day. Once we got back home, we had dinner, washed the dishes, and then went for a walk outside. It was a gloomy, cold December evening, but we enjoyed taking strolls through the Italian wilderness. It's definitely a different experience from back in the States. My Aunt Rosa left the house at around 3 p.m., so until my brother returned from his friends, which wouldn't be till the next day, I would be all alone, in a big house, in an isolated area, surrounded by forest. I wasn't really nervous about it because shortly after my aunt left, I started to get tired, and I decided to watch some TV until I fell asleep. As I was falling asleep, I began to hear a noise. It sounded like a drill. So I got up and walked to my father's bedroom window, where the sound seemed to be coming from. Once I was at the window, I looked down and saw two men, dressed in black. One of them was drilling on the window bars on the second floor, directly below my dad's window. At first, I thought maybe my dad had hired someone to work on the house. I was only 13 at the time, and it took me a while to realize that these were the bad guys. After I realized that they weren't dressed like workers, and my dad didn't tell me about any kind of remodeling being done, I started to panic. The men finally removed the bars from the window and entered the house. I bolted to my bedroom to grab my phone. Unfortunately, this was before I got a smartphone. I still had an older model that didn't work too well, especially out here. I dialed my aunt's number, but when she answered the phone, I couldn't hear anything. My heart was beating so fast, it felt like I couldn't breathe. I quickly packed my bag, threw on a jacket, and thought that if I could run outside, I would just hide in the forest. But then I thought to myself, what if they don't even know I'm here? If I get caught trying to run, they could kidnap me, or worse. So I decided to stay and hide inside. When I heard the men moving around the second floor, breaking glass and smashing walls, I became even more terrified. After a few minutes, I heard a car pulling up outside, followed by somebody yelling my name. I then heard, just outside my bedroom door, Damn it! Somebody's here. Let's go. My uncle then came barging into the house. Sophia, are you here? There was some commotion as the intruders left the way they came in from, and my uncle raced up the stairs. After I was reunited with my aunt and uncle, I found out that my aunt could still hear everything on the phone call, even though I couldn't. I had become so frightened that I left my phone on the bedroom floor while I was packing my bag before making the decision to hide in my bathroom. When she heard all the commotion on the other end, she knew that something was wrong. We immediately called the police. The intruders had completely trashed all the rooms on the second floor. The good news is that a few days later, the men were caught by the police doing the same thing to another house. There were five of them total, and they were armed with guns and knives. This was a very eye-opening experience for me that has impacted my adult life. Nowadays, I live in Australia and I've been trained to defend myself and to always be vigilant of my surroundings. The story happened in the fall of 2017. My name is Nadia, 
and I was 27 years old back then. I live in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania with my two friends Nicole and Christina. We rented a house together and shared the same car, which was a 2009 Lexus. My friends and I are very close and are like sisters. This arrangement would not have worked any other way. One day we wanted to go on a road trip together, so we decided to drive from Drexel Hill to another town called Butler. At first, things were going pretty well. Along the way, we would make stops to explore the countryside, take pictures, and enjoy the scenery. It was fall, and it got dark pretty quick. On top of that, our gas-guzzling V8 needed a refill, so we had no choice but to stop at a gas station. We spotted one in the middle of nowhere. Visually, this gas station looked creepy as hell. I thought it might have been abandoned when I first saw it. We pulled up next to a gas pump, and I was about to start filling the tank, when a beat-up white van with tented windows pulled into the gas station parking lot. As soon as I saw it, I immediately got a bad feeling. Christina had to go into the convenience store to use the bathroom. Do you really have to go? This place looks sketchy as hell. It's an emergency. There's no need to be paranoid. I'll be quick. Alright, just hurry up. Don't waste your time scrolling through your phone like you always do. Christina then went inside the store. As soon as she did, the driver exited the white van and followed her inside. My spidey sense told me that something was about to go down, so I decided to go inside as well. As soon as I walked in, I heard Christina screaming. The driver of the van was dragging Christina to what looked like a back door. I quickly got out my pocket knife and stabbed the man in the back. The man screamed and let go of Christina. I used the opportunity to grab Christina's hand and pull her to her feet. The man staggered and struggled to pull the knife out of his back. He was so angry that his face was red. He then let out a shout of pure rage and chased us out of the store. Luckily for us, we were able to make it back to the car. I put it into drive and drove out of there as quickly as possible. In my rearview mirror, I saw the white van from before pull out of the gas station parking lot and began to follow us. Fortunately for us, our Lexus had a more capable engine, so I put the pedal to the floor and we eventually lost him. His busted up kidnap mobile wasn't able to keep up. We went to the police station to file a report, but we never heard anything back. There were no employees present when all of this went down inside the store. And this was definitely the kind of place that may or may not have working security cameras. We were all pretty shaken up about this. It's not every day that you see one of your best friends literally being dragged away by a stranger. But thankfully, I was able to intervene and save her. This story happened to me when I was only 10 years old. I grew up in a popular suburb of Phoenix, Arizona. We lived in the third house on a street that was just off the neighborhood's main road. My house had an enclosed front porch with a basketball hoop and a bike rack. One day I was home by myself and decided to go to the local park. This was probably around 4 p.m. or so. At this time, our neighborhood wasn't fully developed, so having a lot of traffic wasn't common. My sister and I have always been paranoid about sketchy white vans because of the programs they showed us at school. So when I noticed one cruising down the main road, I thought it was strange, but I figured it might have been a construction worker and continued. I was one of those kids who would ride his bike around just to explore the area. So I was never too worried in my neighborhood. If someone did come after me, I knew all the best routes to lose someone. Anyways, I took my usual path and went down a side street through a cul-de-sac instead of the main road. When I arrived at the park, 
I noticed another neighborhood kid named Parker, who was in the open field next to the playground. After a while of hanging out with him, I figured that my parents would probably be home from work by now. When I first left the park, I realized I had forgotten my water bottle. It was a tin Spider-Man water bottle, and that was a big deal to 10-year-old me. There was no way I was leaving that behind. After turning around, I was soon back at the hilltop, overlooking the playground and the field. Parker was nowhere to be seen. I had been gone for maybe 30 seconds. I then saw the white van from before, parked on the side of the road near the playground. My heart sank once I saw Parker's bike lying on the ground next to the van with one of its wheels still turning. I froze up. I was pretty sure whoever was driving the van saw me. I quickly turned around and sped down the sidewalk and booked it home. Once I got back to my house, I made sure I didn't leave my bicycle by the front door or the porch. Instead, I threw it over the back gate so it wouldn't be visible from the road. After this, I rushed inside and locked the door. I was covered head to toe in sweat. After about 20 seconds of catching my breath, I decided to peer out through the peephole, and for a split second, my heart stopped. I could see the white van slowly making its way down the main road, driving past my street and out of sight. Now, at the time, I thought that Parker had been kidnapped and the white van was now hunting for me, and even now, I don't think that was an unreasonable conclusion to come to. But I would be lying to you if I said that there were reports of a missing child and the police were called in to investigate and my parents had to stand next to me while I told a detective what I saw. But the truth is, I never saw Parker being pulled into the van. It is entirely possible that the driver could have said something to him and he got scared and ran off without his bike. That wouldn't have made front page news, but I still feel like I would have heard about it. Honestly, I didn't know Parker that well. I saw him around the park sometimes, but I wouldn't say that we were friends. Point being, he could have moved away, or might have just been visiting. And as creepy as it was seeing that white van slowly driving down the road, it's unlikely they would be driving like that after just having kidnapped a child. I don't know what happened to Parker, because after that day, I never saw him or that white van ever again. The lesson here is to always be aware of your surroundings and to teach your kids to do the same because you never know what could happen even in the places where you feel the safest. I'm 19 and currently attending university. This encounter happened to me when I was in secondary school around age 14 or 15. It was an IT lesson, so you know I was doing the usual, playing games and messing around with instant messenger, until the class was interrupted by two police officers. After the excitement died down, they proceeded to tell us that we needed to be careful. There was reports of a middle-aged man driving around this area in a white Toyota van harassing girls around our age and telling them to come for a ride. A few days had passed since the police warned us. I would usually finish up at around 2.35 p.m., but I decided to stay later that day to catch up on some homework. So I left school around 4 p.m. Of course, when I got to the bus station, it had already left. The bus driver was a real jackass. So I decided to walk home. If only I had known what was going to happen that day, I would have called my mom to come pick me up. I would say the walk home was about 30 minutes. I was about three quarters of the way home when I reached this long stretch of road that ran through a few fields with a small path alongside for bikes. This road was dark and had no streetlights. Since it was winter, 
It was already dark by this point. I was about halfway down the road. A few cars had passed me, but no big deal. That's when I saw some headlights approaching me. I didn't take much notice at first, as I assumed it was another passerby. That's when I see a white Toyota van slowly pass me and pull into a driveway that led to a farmhouse. This was about 200 meters in front of me, so I ended up walking past the van. I'm obviously on high alert by now. I hear the door swing open, and I turn around to see this tall, sketchy-looking man stepping out of the van and just stands there, staring at me. At this point, I'm ready to get the hell out of there, and I sprint to either the next farmhouse or the end of the road. But I quickly realized that these two options may be too far out of reach. I turn around again to see the man coming toward me. I bolted it as fast as possible. I was wearing one of those stupid pencil skirts we had to wear. I could hear the man running behind me. He was fast too. The road was veering to the right. As soon as I got around the bend, I was out of sight for a few seconds. I literally threw myself into this large bramble bush and sat there hiding and waiting. A few moments go by and he's nowhere to be seen. I was sure that he was right behind me, so after about 10 to 15 minutes, I thought it was safe to pull myself out of the bush. I was covered in scratches and scrapes. At the time, I didn't care. My main priority was hiding. I began walking down the road again. I was nearing the streetlights and my neighborhood, so I thought I would be okay. Until I saw the white van pass me again. I sprinted all the way back home, and as I got onto my road, I saw him passing by again, this time in the opposite direction. As soon as I got back, I told my parents, and they called the police and reported it. They didn't find him that night, but he was arrested a few days later, lurking outside our school, attempting to talk to the girl students again. I assume he was convicted, as I've never seen him again. Sometimes I still wonder what was going through his mind that night, and what would have happened if he got a hold of me. What exactly were his intentions? I think I know the answer, but it still makes my skin crawl. When I was a kid, I was hanging out at this place called the Pinecone Forest, which is what the neighborhood kids would call the small patch of trees on the side of the road. I was picking bark off one of the trees to pass the time, waiting for my friend Frankie to finish his homework so we could play together. Out of nowhere, it seemed, a man came up to me. I could smell him before I saw him. He reeked of stale cigarette smoke. I was a bit scared to even look at him. He wasn't very old, but one of his eyes was cloudy and his teeth and fingernails were stained yellow. My mom taught me to be nice to people, so I faked a smile and said hello. What you doing? The smell of his breath was the worst. Um, I'm picking bark off this tree? You shouldn't do that. That's like picking off a tree's skin. How would you feel if somebody peeled off your skin? He said this while lightly pinching my arm with his sharp yellow fingernails. I don't know, I replied and took my arm back. Just then, Frankie's mother called me to the door and told me to come and wait inside. I didn't think anything of the whole thing at the time. Yesterday, when I was visiting my sister's house with my mom, watching my son and nephews play around in the yard, I remembered this encounter and brought it up to my mom. She had this look of, I don't know, guilt maybe? She said it was probably time that I knew the whole story. She thought I had forgotten about the whole encounter, so she never brought it up to me. First, you should know that the neighborhood I grew up in is a small, tight-knit community. Everyone knew everyone there, and there was no reason for an outsider to be there. 
unless they were visiting someone. Anyway, this is what happened. Frankie's mom, Sonia, noticed a white van with no windows parked on the side of the road. She didn't recognize it, but figured that it was someone visiting one of her neighbors. Sonia later told the police that the van had been there all morning and afternoon. She was kind of keeping an eye on it. She said it gave her a bad feeling. Her house had a huge window in front, facing the pine cone forest, and the van was parked next to it. She saw me waiting for Frankie and kept a constant eye on the van while holding the phone just in case. She then saw the man exit the back of the van and walk up to me. As soon as she saw him grabbing my arm, she called the cops right away. It was then that she told me to come inside. The cops stopped the man outside the neighborhood. In the back of his van were binoculars, a Polaroid camera, and pictures of me taped all over the walls and ceiling. The photos were of me at school, my grandparents' house, at the bank with my mom. But the story doesn't end there. He had a key to a storage unit on him. Inside the unit, they found a cabinet full of knives. And I'm talking about a lot of knives in all shapes and sizes. There was also a few books on the human anatomy, obstetrical equipment, duct tape, and 10 empty five gallon buckets. In the middle of this unit was an old bed that was used to restrain mental patients, so it had wrist and ankle straps. The entire inside of the unit was covered in plastic wrapping. Last my mom heard about him, he was locked away in a high security mental institution for the criminally insane. For the sake of the story, I am going to call myself Rodney. This happened in 2011, around February. English is my second language, so please bear with me. For some information, I am a 33-year-old Haitian male living on the outskirts of London. I was 20 at the time, and I was still living with my parents. I was dating my first girlfriend, who I will refer to as Nicole. Nicole was 19, and the first six months of the relationship went well, and we had a lot of things in common. Nicole was originally from Martinique, which is a small island in the Caribbean. Many of the population there speak French, and so do I. She lived with her older brother and two male cousins. I thought I had found the one, but I was sadly mistaken. As our relationship progressed, she became more and more controlling. She would constantly argue with me and would yell at me if she found out that I had played video games online with my longtime female friends. She even tried to fight one of my female friends because she thought I was cheating on her. My friend got the best of her, of course, and ended up kicking her ass. Eventually, I had enough and broke up with her. But things began to happen about a month after our breakup, when I started dating the girl who would eventually become my wife. I'll refer to her as Jennifer. When Nicole found out that I was dating somebody else, she became furious. She started calling my phone multiple times and sending me threatening emails. Her brother also left me some very alarming voicemails. You fucking scumbag. You're going to suffer for hurting my little sister's feelings. I know where you live, and I'm coming for you. Jennifer was concerned, but I didn't think anything would happen. But again, I was sadly mistaken. One night, both of my parents were out of town, so Jennifer and I were all alone, having a good time. We then heard someone hitting the front door. It wasn't like somebody was knocking. It was like they were trying to break it down. I told you that I would come for you, didn't I? I'm going to kill you and that little bitch you're with. You should have never hurt my sister. And now you're going to pay. I recognized the man's voice right away. It was Nicole's older brother. 
we ran upstairs to my bedroom, and we soon heard the maniac downstairs bust open the front door and began to make his way inside, where we also heard other people running into the house, followed by a commotion. We locked ourselves in the bedroom and called the police. They showed up not even a minute later. It turns out that the other people who ran into the house were our next door neighbors. They saw what was going on and decided to intervene. The police found a huge kitchen knife in his backpack. Both my ex-girlfriend and her older brother were arrested for attempted manslaughter. Now I know what you might be thinking. Attempted manslaughter? The man planned on murdering both of us. But remember, this is the UK. The justice system here is a complete joke. However, Nicole and her deranged brother were deported back to Martinique. But there's just one problem with this. Martinique is a French territory, so they can easily travel back to France, then sneak back into London from there. Jennifer and I have moved on with our lives and are now married. I just hope that Nicole and her psycho brother don't try to hunt us down again. I am a 27-year-old male. I spent about a year in San Francisco as part of a job. Although I enjoy living in the Bay Area very much, the extremely high cost of living there and the distance from friends and family was too difficult for long-term stability. As such, I was eager to return to my home state of Louisiana. I ended up finding a job near my hometown that was a much better fit for me and was closer to my family. After resigning from my position, I quickly packed my belongings into my car and began the 2,000 mile journey back home. Given that I had very long work days, I had no time to explore the beautiful state of California while I was living there. Therefore, I decided to fully enjoy myself and visit some nice places along the way. I met up with friends in SoCal and visited the beaches in Los Angeles and San Diego. After a few days, I resumed my journey. I stopped at a rest area in Arizona to refill my gas tank and grab some lunch. While walking back from the restroom, I noticed a beat up old van in the parking lot. It was white and had red and blue streaks. I saw a man sitting in the driver's seat, smoking a cigarette. He looked like the kind of person that panhandles outside of a gas station. As I walked by, the man smiled and waved at me. I immediately felt a deep discomfort in my chest that spread to my gut. I gave him a quick nod and carried on, then promptly got into my car and drove off. I stopped at a hotel in Tucson for the night. After checking in, I went back to my car to retrieve some things. I immediately noticed a beat up van in the parking lot in front of the hotel. It looked just like the van from the rest area. At first, I brushed it off as just another creepy old van, but I recognized the red and blue paint streaks on the side. This design didn't look like it was on purpose, more like it was parked next to some half-assed painters, so this was definitely the same van I saw at the rest area. I figured maybe it was some bizarre coincidence and the man was heading in the same direction I was. I quickly retreated to my hotel room for the night. The following morning, once I got to my car, I looked at the front parking lot. The van was no longer there. I was relieved and resumed my journey. I decided to make a stop in Albuquerque to do some exploring. There was a festival taking place in the downtown area I walked around and enjoyed the live music. As I stood in line at one of the food trucks, I started to experience that weird sensation when you're in danger and immediately saw a man about 200 feet away from me, staring. He was standing beside a tree, smoking a cigarette. 
it was the same man from the rest area. I decided to walk towards him to get a better look, and he quickly disappeared into the crowd. I was shocked. This was no longer a coincidence. This man was following me. I quickly returned to my car and drove off. I then called my parents while I was on the highway. I told them about the man who was following me. My dad just brushed it off and said, You know, a lot of people are traveling on the same roads and stopping in the same cities along the way. I think you're just being paranoid. My mom, on the other hand, seemed a bit more concerned. Uh, please be aware of your surroundings and make sure you're keeping your phone charged. They both advised me to stop at my brother's house in Dallas rather than drive straight to Louisiana. I drove for six more hours. Once it became dark, I decided to pull over at a rest area along a country road. I was exhausted and needed a break. The rest area was very remote and had very little lighting. I literally passed out on my steering wheel once I was parked. I was woken up by a very loud knock at the driver's side window. I turned to my left and saw someone standing outside. It was dark and I couldn't see who the person was at first. I turned on the dome lights and I immediately recognized the person. I then saw a beat up white van parked right next to my car. My heart began racing. The man grinned at me and signaled for me to roll down my window. I need some help. Roll down your window. Now. Again, I shook my head and said no. He immediately became upset and began pounding on my window. The man then attempted to open my door, but luckily... I kept all my car doors locked. He then pulled out a knife and hissed. Open your damn door. I started my engine and put my car into reverse. He began running after my car with a knife in his hand. I couldn't stop hyperventilating. I was on the verge of a panic attack. But I drove out of the rest area and continued down the highway. I called up my parents again and informed them about what just happened. They were shocked. No one could dismiss this as a coincidence now. They believed it would be worthwhile to call the police, but that it might be difficult for them to really do anything about it, as the rest area was in the middle of nowhere, and it was unlikely that there were any cameras in the parking lot. I was about five hours from my brother's house. My parents encouraged me to stop at the nearest big city, which was about an hour away, and stay at a hotel for the night. I ended up contacting the police the very next day and filed a report. I provided the rest stop's location and a description of the van. The officer forwarded that information to the highway patrol, but as expected, they couldn't do anything about it. The man was probably miles away by that point, I was strongly encouraged to stay off the country roads and avoid driving at night. I eventually made it to Dallas and told my brother and my sister-in-law about what was happening. My brother, being the true gun-loving Texan he is, said that he would have his firearms ready just in case something happened. I spent about a week in Dallas and then drove back home to Louisiana. Thankfully, I did not encounter that man again. Since this traumatic experience, I have refrained from taking long road trips alone, and I'm almost always scared to drive through the countrysides now. It's almost too easy to disappear without a trace in these areas. What frightens me the most about all this is that a random stranger relentlessly followed me for several miles from Arizona to Texas over the course of two days. I always wonder what his intentions were and what would have happened if I wasn't able to escape from that rest area.
The story happened in the fall of 2009. I used to live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. For some information, my name is Vanessa, and I'm a 30-year-old woman, but I was 16 back then, and this was the year that I got my driver's license, and my father bought me my first car, which was a 2009 Infiniti G37 sedan. I have three sisters named Sasha, Clarice, and Sabrina. They were all happy for me when I got my driver's license. So to celebrate, we decided to take a road trip to Delaware County to visit our cousins and other extended family members. Our father and stepmother were not very strict parents and were pretty laid back. So they didn't mind us taking this trip. They just reminded us to drive carefully and to always be aware of other drivers on the road. So we packed our bags and hit the road to spend the weekend at our uncle's house. The road trip to Delaware County went well, but when we headed back is where shit went south. We were supposed to leave Sunday afternoon, but we were all having a good time with our cousins, so we didn't pay attention to the time and ended up leaving around 9 p.m. Unfortunately, we had to go because we had school the next day. There wasn't a lot of traffic, and we made a stop at a random Target store so we could buy some snacks. Almost no one was in the store except for this strange man who kept staring at us. He was about six feet tall, had long, greasy, unkept hair, and yellow teeth. My sisters and I noticed him and told each other to keep our distance. While we were creeped out by this guy, we didn't think too much of it, but we started to get worried whenever we would go down another aisle, he would follow us. He eventually addressed us and said, Ah, oh, you girls look so gorgeous tonight. Sabrina, who has a big mouth, responded with, Um, ew, you can fuck off now, pedo. Get a life. Uh, you better watch your mouth, little girl. I paid you a compliment, and you have the nerve to run your mouth? This is when I told my sisters that we should leave. We went to the checkout line and paid for our snacks, but when we got outside and walked towards our car, the man emerged from between two parked cars and rushed at us with a knife. I'm gonna watch your guts spill out like sausages. We went into full panic mode and began running. We decided not to run to our cars, because if we tried to open our car doors, the maniac would definitely catch us. Luckily the man wasn't very fast, and he could not keep up with us. We crossed the street and decided to hide behind some large trees. We managed to outrun him, but he was still looking for us. I'm going to find you, and when I do, I'm going to enjoy separating your heads from your fucking bodies. Fortunately, he did not see us, and we were able to run back to our car. It was only when we got back that he finally spotted us. I quickly put the car into drive and floored it out of there. But the drama was far from over. To our absolute horror, a pickup truck began tailing us. I made a quick getaway from the Target parking lot, but I wasn't driving very fast because I thought it was over. The road we were driving on now was narrow, so I couldn't go any faster to escape him. He was tailgating us and even hit the back of my car. Eventually the road widened, so I used it to my advantage and put the pedal to the floor. His old truck couldn't keep up. I then made a sharp right turn. He also turned, but he was too far behind. By the time we got to the highway, I lost him completely. Looking back now, I regret not going to the police station, but we were all freaking out and not thinking clearly. But in the end, I'm glad that we didn't get decapitated 
by that absolute maniac. I grew up in Oklahoma. This happened when I was about 10 and my brother was 12. We were playing out in our front yard one afternoon when our neighbor called us over. He lived one house away and we hadn't interacted with him before. Maybe just saying hello if we passed by when he happened to be outside. I've always been a really shy kid, so I stayed back while my brother went up and asked what he wanted. He explained that he was planning on going out of town within the next few days, and he wanted us to take care of his pool while he was gone. He said that summers were too hot for kids not to be swimming. My brother agreed, and we were told to come over in two days. On top of being shy, I was also very paranoid, and I had this weird feeling about our neighbor. This proposal came out of nowhere. I told my brother, You can go if you want, but count me out. I guess my mom saw us talking to him and came outside and asked what he wanted. We explained his story. Um, no, you two aren't going over there by yourselves. We don't even know that man. Two days later, we still see his car in the driveway and lights on inside. Something about him bothered me. I told my parents that he never left for his vacation, so he must have been lying to us for some reason. They just sort of dismissed me and said that he probably just canceled his plans. Over the summer, I kept noticing him mowing the lawn two or three times a week. He never wore a shirt. He just went up and down his yard for hours. Once again, I would tell my parents how weird I thought he was, but they just kept brushing me off. A few more months went by, and school was back in session by now. I noticed him sitting outside his front porch every day the school bus drove by, and he would just watch us all get off with this blank, unmoving expression. When someone is staring daggers at you like that, it makes you feel uncomfortable. Eventually, my parents decided to install a pool of our own. We had been asking for one for several years. They had to remove a large portion of our fence to get equipment into our backyard. It was one of those above-ground pools you had to anchor, but the ground here can be very rocky, and it took much longer to dig than expected. With the fence gone, our weird neighbor could now see directly into our backyard. I sometimes saw him watching from one of his windows. By the time the pool was completed, it was warm enough to go swimming. I headed outside in my swimsuit, with my clothes over the top. I immediately saw our neighbor staring at me, and decided to swim with my clothes on instead. Over time, I picked up on something. My neighbor wouldn't watch my brother and his friends. Only me. The fence was eventually rebuilt, which I was glad. One day I was happily swimming in our backyard when my dad comes up to me. Hey son, I need to talk to you for a second. I get out and I sit with him. Son, I have to say that I'm sorry. Your mom and I get really busy and sometimes we just forget to listen. And that's not right. I'm glad you trusted your instincts. It turns out our neighbor was a very bad man. He didn't go into too much detail since I was still young, but on the school bus, some of the kids were talking. Our creepy neighbor had invited another girl from down the street to come swim in his pool. He brought her inside his house and started taking photos of her in her swimsuit and then led her outside and told her that she needed sunscreen and would apply it for her. You get the idea. The girl's older sister came looking for her. She knew that her sister had gone inside, but he slammed the door in her face. So she ran home to tell her parents. The police were called, and he was arrested. His computer was filled with photos of children from around the area. Pictures of me could have been on it. They also found an alarming amount of CP. What still bothers me to this day is that his wife stayed by his side. Mind you, they had children who were toddlers at the time. He was convicted, but has since been released and is now back with his family. We eventually moved away for a different reason, 
but I can't imagine ever having to look at that man ever again. This story happened in the summer of 2011. For some background, I live in Midwest Oklahoma. My girlfriend Angela and I were renting a four-bedroom house at the time. We were home one night, chilling on the couch. At some point, we both fell asleep, and I began dreaming. We were walking around our neighborhood when we saw a man trying to break into a car. He was hitting the car window with a hammer. The noise was very loud, and he wasn't trying to be discreet. I wanted to intervene, but my girlfriend held me back and then whispered into my ear, Someone is outside our door. You need to wake up. I suddenly woke up and heard a loud noise, just like the one in my dream. My heart was pounding. I looked out the window that overlooked the front doorstep, and I saw a figure holding what looked like a hammer. I panicked and woke up my girlfriend. When she saw what was going on, she screamed. The intruder turned his attention to the window and managed to break it. Luckily for me, I always had my gun locked and loaded. The intruder was about to make his way inside when I confronted him, aiming the gun directly at his head. I shouted at the man. You make one more move and they'll be scraping your brains off my porch. I didn't say those exact words because I was absolutely scared out of my mind, but I did convey that I would end his life if he tried coming inside. The figure backed away with his hands up, then ran off into the darkness. I called the police right after and filed a report. We never heard anything back from them, of course. I couldn't give an accurate description, and the man took his hammer with him. He also didn't cut himself when he smashed the window, so we'll give him credit for being properly dressed for the occasion, but I'm glad I woke up in time. It's amazing how a simple dream can save your life. This happened in March of this year. My friends and I decided to go to this abandoned campsite located in the eastern Oklahoma countryside. I had been there the year before. The property was supposedly haunted. This is not a paranormal story. I'm just telling you the reason that we wanted to check it out. There were five of us all together. Tyler, Jordan, Abigail, Angela, and myself. We decided to enhance the experience by bringing alcohol and weed. We had two bottles of Henry and nine pre-rolled joints. We arrived around 1130, so it was dark by then. We brought along flashlights and gloves, so we were ready to go exploring. But about 15 minutes in, Angela and Abigail both wanted to go back because they were complaining about it being boring. But the rest of us had put too much into planning this trip, so we had to convince them to keep going. This required opening up one of the bottles of Henry. I personally don't like the taste of alcohol, but I decided that I would be doing some drinking that night. I also fired up a joint. One thing about me though, is that when I'm drunk and high at the same time, I tend to get very paranoid. It obviously didn't help that we were two miles deep into the woods. Yeah, I wasn't making the best choices that night. After a while, the paranoia began to kick in. I started hearing footsteps disturbing the leaves behind us. I was convinced enough to yell out, Hey, is anyone there? Again, this probably wasn't the best idea, because it freaked out Abigail and Angela. Tyler even asked me, Dude, what are you going on about? Look, I know I'm kind of fucked up right now, but I'm hearing someone following us. It's probably just an animal, dumbass. How stoned are you? We kept going, but I continued to hear what I thought were footsteps behind us. The thought of it being an animal didn't make me feel any better. I've never seen a black bear in the wild, but I was pretty sure they were native to this area of Oklahoma. 
We got to the campsite soon after. We sat at a wooden table to rest after walking five miles in the dark. It was around 2.50 a.m. at this point, and we decided to start partying. Let's stop here for a moment and take stock of the situation. A bunch of young adults smoking and drinking in the dead of night on a deserted campground in the middle of the vast Oklahoma forest. There were several rumors as to why this place had shut down. Some say that one of the camp counselors lost his mind and murdered several children with a fire axe. Of course, there is no evidence that this actually ever happened. My guess is this place shut down because of financial reasons. It was now just a collection of abandoned cabins and a rec hall with a caved-in roof. We were definitely being loud as hell. When I drink, the alcohol runs right through me, so I have to relieve myself multiple times. I told the gang that I had to piss and went to go find a tree. I decided to walk further away from the group until they were out of sight. I wanted to avoid any pranks they would pull on me while I was doing my business. When I was midstream, I heard a twig snap about 15 feet behind me. I didn't think it was one of my friends, since the noise was in the opposite direction they were in. I pulled out my phone, turned on the flashlight, and nearly shat my pants at what I saw. Standing about 15 feet away, I saw four hooded figures among the trees. I zipped up my damn pants before my stream was even finished and started running back toward the group. Guys, we need to leave here now. We aren't alone out here. They must have thought I was pranking them until they saw that I was running. They all got up and started sprinting. I heard more footsteps behind us and all around us. I genuinely thought that I was about to die. We were so deep in the woods that no one would hear us scream if we were slaughtered. None of us were thinking straight because of the recreational influence. Angela fell, and I guess no one else noticed except for me. I quickly turned to help her. Once I got her back on her feet, we couldn't tell where the rest of the group went. The moonlight was barely helping, and I didn't want to turn on my flashlight and give away our position. Angela was a mess at this point, crying and freaking out, so I had to try to calm her down and keep moving even though I felt like I was having a panic attack myself. We kept going until we saw what looked like an old shed. I devised a plan to use the shed as cover while I called the others on my phone. Once we made our way inside, we stopped hearing the footsteps, so I thought we had lost them. The shed was actually a cabin with three rooms and a hallway. Once we got to the entrance, we were bombarded by a putrid smell. It damn near made me throw up all the Henry I had earlier. Angela, however, couldn't hold back and vomited right away. I tried calling Tyler and Jordan, but it just went straight to voicemail. I didn't have Abigail's number, and Angela couldn't help since her phone was dead. The smell was becoming unbearable, and I had a feeling I knew what it was. I left the entrance and made my way further inside. There was nothing of interest in the first two rooms, but the third I arrived at was where the stench was coming from. My heart was in my throat as I opened the door. I shined my light inside and was met with the most disturbing thing I think I've ever seen in my life. I know that a lot of you aren't going to believe me, but I'm going to tell you what I saw. At first, I was stunned when I saw a face on the floor staring up at me. It was only when I panned to my light that I realized that the head wasn't connected to anything. Leaning up against the wall were two torsos. Ah, oh, fuck. There is something else that was there that I just can't bring myself to tell you. I like to think that I just imagined it, but I know it was there. I had to stay sharp if we were going to escape. I looked at the maps on my phone and saw that we were still two miles away from any roads. Angela was still bawling her eyes out, 
crying about how she didn't want to die. Honestly, I thought it was likely that we would end up dying that night. We heard the footsteps racing toward the cabin outside. I grabbed Angela and told her, If you don't want to die, we have to run. And don't look back. I planned on running in the opposite direction of the road, while Angela made for the road. I would hide somewhere until whoever was following us passed us. Then I would eventually come out and head for the road. I took off, yelling to get their attention. I should mention that I'm in pretty good shape, since I used to play sports in school, so I was capable of running long distances. Once I was far enough away, I got down low to the ground behind a tree and covered up with leaves and branches to camouflage myself. I was already wearing dark clothing, so I felt this was my best chance. My biggest fear came true when I could feel something crawling down my leg. I've had arachnophobia since I was little, and I've been bitten by spiders before. If not for the adrenaline, I definitely would have freaked out and given away my hiding spot. After what felt like hours, what was probably more like two minutes, I could hear the footsteps running away from where I was. I still wanted to play it safe, and stayed down there for another 15 minutes before I thought it was safe enough to make a break for it. Soon I was back on my feet, heading in the direction the road was in. It was now 2.17 a.m. I tried my mom and dad's cell. Neither of them picked up. So I called the house phone. Yes, we still have those. After two rings, my dad picked up, and he sounded pissed. I immediately told him the circumstances and about the bodies I found, and that I was separated from all my friends. While I was on the phone with him, Jordan finally noticed that I had tried to call him. So I hung up with my dad and answered Jordan's call. Dude, where the hell are you? Angela and I got separated from you guys. I told her to run toward the road while I distracted whoever was chasing us. See if you can find her there. I'm heading that way right now, so I'll be there soon. Okay, man. Watch your ass. I ended up getting there before the rest of the group. Angela came out from her hiding place. She told me that she thought I was a goner for sure. I sent Jordan our location, and they showed up about five minutes later. We were all relieved to see that everyone was okay. Angela and Jordan hugged each other for about two minutes straight. Hey guys, that's lovely and everything, but we really should get out of here. Once we were back in the car, I told them about what I saw in the cabin. They asked me why I hadn't called the cops yet. Um, I don't know. Maybe it had something to do with being chased through the fucking woods. I called up the police and gave them an approximate location of where I found the bodies. But I never heard back from them. I guess whoever was out there must have hidden or destroyed the evidence. I still have reoccurring nightmares about what I saw in those woods. There's always a reason to be afraid.